Okay, uh, it's 5.02. Welcome to the Monday, August 17th, uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Workshop. Uh, Phil, could you go ahead and uh, call on the attendance? Yes. So President McFarland is absent. We know Vice President Singer. Here. Secretary Rauch is here. Treasurer Friedel. Here. Member Baker. Here. Member Blazy. And Member Lauterbach. Here. All right, so we've got five, we've got a quorum. Okay, and uh, we'll keep an eye on the time. <laughs> if uh, Brad joins us, then we can let the record show. Yep. So uh, we will move into item two on our diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, agenda. We have 2.1, ensure alignment of strategic actions to relevant subcommittees. Uh, Amy, are you going to uh, take this? I'm going to take this, and I'm actually going to turn this partly over to Phil and ask Phil to kick us off tonight. Um, Phil, you good? I am good. Bear with me for a second while I get everything up. And then I'll just pick up when you leave off. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. I if Megan can fix that for me. Yep, she'll work on that. You should be good to go now. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right. I have to laugh um, at myself because I think if any of my MPS teachers that taught me English or writing knew that I was going to do a book report right now, they'd probably laugh at me because that was not my strongest subject. But here we are. So, um, so. If you have or have not had a chance to read um, How to Be an Inclusive Leader by Jennifer Brown, I think, um, you know, it, it's a book that struck me as very um, timely for us as the board as, as an opportunity for us to lead in this area and, and go on this journey together with, with our administrative staff um, as, as we lead change in our district. So, um, I've got a pop quiz for you. Who, does anybody know who this is? No, I don't. All right, this is Megan Rapino. So Meg, if you remember back from the World Cup in 2019, Megan Rapino was the uh, the de facto captain and, and the Michael Jordan of the women's uh, national soccer team. I think what's more striking about this picture is is the context in which it was taken. Um, to set the stage, France and the U.S. were the top two teams in the World Cup that year for the women. And they ended up meeting in the semifinals. So pretty much whoever won this game was probably going to win the World Cup gold. And it was on France's home turf. <clears throat> Less than 24 hours before this, uh, President openly feuds with her on Twitter and calls her out. Game's tied 1-1. There's a penalty kick given to the U.S. side, she walks up, buries the ball in the back of the net, strikes this pose to give the U.S. a 2-1 lead, and eventually wins the game 2-1, setting up the stage for what was was a relatively easy gold, cup, or gold, gold medal win for them. <clears throat> what may not be readily apparent in this picture, or is not readily apparent in this picture, is Megan is one of five kids. There were seven kids raised in the household after her parents adopted 
her two cousins when their aunt passed away. She's a fraternal twin. Mom is a waitress, dad is a contractor. Her brother is actively serving a sentence in Supermax in California due to drug addiction and burglary charges. Both her dad and her grandfather are army veterans. She's openly gay. But with all that, she was named the 2019 Sports Illustrated Sports Person of the Year and is a three-time World Cup winner and won the Golden Boot, which is given to the athlete that scores the most goals in, goals in the World Cup. I think this is a pretty good example of what happens when somebody is allowed to be themselves and brings their whole self to the table. And Megan has gone through a lot in her background, as you can tell by her bio. But at the end of the day, you know, she has the confidence to deliver at, at the pinnacle of success. Um, and I think, you know, it's a reflection on us as leaders in the district to say, how do we ensure that we create a setting and systems so that every single student, given Megan's background or not, has the ability to succeed as she did or does every day. You know, so in the book, uh, Jennifer Brown talks about this idea of the employee or student iceberg. And I think it's a really good analogy because you know, a lot of times when we think of DEI, we think of what's on the surface and what we can see and observe. How somebody speaks, if they have an accent, physical traits, skin color, um, spoken languages, appearance, so on and so forth. And I think, you know, that's just the surface. And, and to some extent, we have a lot of work to do there, but to a greater extent, I think sometimes we we kind of overlook what's beneath the surface and how much that matters. You know, the analogy always is, is that the iceberg 10% is above the water and 90% is below the water. And, you know, when you, when you think of Megan as an example, going back to some of the things that she was raised with, you know, it was a You know, with, with seven kids in the house, fraternal twin, mom being a waitress, dad's a contractor, brothers in Supermax, and and there's um, dad and grandfather both served our country as well. You know, she's bringing a lot to the table that probably wasn't seen for, for most of her childhood and most of her upbringing. Um, and I think, you know, these are things that that while they may not be apparent to us, affect the success of our employees and our students day in and day out. And <clears throat> it's, it's one of these things that, that um, we as leaders of this district need to recognize and, and ensure that we create a conducive environment where no matter what's below the surface, still have the opportunity to succeed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with all of this, you know, Sports Illustrated interviews Megan Rapinoe and says, what's your biggest fear? And it floored me to think that she was quoted as saying, my biggest fear is that people will think I'm a fraud. Pretty much it, it struck me because She's about the furthest thing that I think of uh, when I think of a fraud. And, and it shows that no matter how much success an individual student may or may not have, there's still some internal demons that we have to make sure are dealt with healthy um, and respectfully and, and can de deliver outcomes um, for, for each individual student. Um, <clears throat> so in, in the book, 
Jennifer Brown talks a lot about starting where you are and how each individual circumstance and each situation that you're in can be different. And I thought this is a really good, it, it helped me really understand that we don't have to be experts in every single situation, but recognizing that when we start where we are at the moment, there's a, 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 a good continuum to follow and, and opportunity to be successful. You know, so, so Jennifer shares <clears throat> this inclusive leader continuum in the book, and I thought it was, was great for us to review. And, and phase one is unaware. I think, um, you know, as a community, um, there's a large probability that many of us are at phase one. And I think it's also important to note that in each situation, um, you may be at the phase one unaware stage in that moment, and that's okay. Um, I think it's important to note that, you know, DEI struggles for us as a district do not have to come from a pejorative place. They are what they are, and we can choose to address them in a constructive and meaningful way. Um, so the unaware stage is you, you think diversity is compliance related. I think somebody's telling you you have to do it. And, it, and simply tolerate it. You know, this is kind of a um, perception that while well, we have a DEI department or we have a chief inclusion officer, so that's, that's good enough. Um, but this is really where we as leaders need to broaden, broaden our horizons, show respect. Um, I thought this one was pretty interesting, keeping quiet and using the 80-20 rule to say, I need to be listening 80% of the time and maybe asking questions 20% of the time and to challenge assumptions um, to, to gain a better level of understanding. And now we move to the aware stage. So you are aware that you have a role to play and you are educating yourself on how best to move forward. Um, you know, the way that I contextualize this is we're dedicated to continuous learning. You need to be vulnerable and share your own stories. And this one I think is, is kind of hard for some of us, but um, to call out biases and, and to say, if I'm around the water cooler and, and hear a joke or something phrased a certain way to actually call it out and say, you know, that's, that's probably not the best way to say that. It's uncomfortable, but it, it starts us on our journey. You know, continuing forward <clears throat> into the active stage, you've shifted your priorities and you're finding your voice as you begin to take meaningful action in support of others. Some of the key questions to ask myself are, who am I supporting? How can I support others with my voice, especially with us as leaders, whether it's on the board or um, in upper levels of management and, and in MPS as well as how can I use my voice in my current role um, to advocate for others? And then can I, active, can I activate for a different community? Um, you know, I think one of the examples that Jennifer Brown uses in the book is a leader, an inclusive leader that develops a great relationship with an African-American um, new hire in his organization and advocated for him as a mentor, um, but then kind of realized to himself that hey, this is pretty comfortable for me because of the friendship and mentorship that I've developed with, with this new hire. And how, how do I reach out to an, another um, minority group in my company to, to lend my voice to a different community? 
And I think what's important to note there is just because this leader, as an example, with an African-American uh, new hire is at the active stage in his journey. Um, if he goes and meets with uh, a member of the LGBT community, he may move all the way back to unaware in phase one, but is going to start that that um, journey over again. And that's okay. And then finally, phase four is an, uh, an advocate. So you're proactively and consistently con confronting discrimination and working to bring about change in order to prevent it on a systemic level. Um, so some of the things to think about here are, where do I challenge systems in my organization? How can I be more public? And then finally, what type of risk am I willing to take in order for others to advocate for others? And, and <clears throat> you know, when Amy asked me to present tonight, I, I, I said to myself, well, and I'm not an expert, I, I don't claim to be an expert. This is pretty intimidating for me. Um, but at the end of the day, if, if we're going to lead this district in the direction that we need it to go, it's, it is imperative for us to step out as leaders and advocate for, for, for the outcomes that we want to see. And to that point, right, the, the first two phases are pretty private, can be low risk, and it's an individual perspective. But in phase three and four, it's much more public, it's higher risk, and, and we have to challenge some organizational systems and policies and procedures to make change. So <clears throat> start where you are. Um, and I, I think just to share a personal anecdote, um, I've tried to educate myself a lot this summer. Um, I think it's probably a number of factors, but uh, raising kids that ask questions now as they get older is, is one of the things challenging me, um, as well as um, changes in the news, current events, and really starting to ask questions about how, how I can become better. So. To that end, um, I thought the, the arm protest in Midland was pretty moving. Um, my wife and I decided that it was important for us to take our kids with us um, and, and to really experience some of the stories that the speakers talked about um, where, whereby I can never know how they truly feel, I can at least listen and seek to understand. And it's imperative that that our family is an ally to, to others in our community and the community as a whole to make sure it's an inviting place for all. And, you know, when we enable all of our students and employees to bring their whole self to work I think we can truly live out our vision statement and make sure that all of our outcomes for every single individual student, no matter their background, are achieved. And, and that's what we strive to be as a, as a public school district. That's what we should drive, strive for. Um, and, and I wanna reiterate this, that it's not only for our students, but also for our employees. So, um, I, I hope that the other board members take a personal stand with me and it does not have to be tonight, but um, would love to hear some feedback into how, how maybe if you've had a chance to get through how to be an inclusive leader yet, um, how it struck you and, and what you took away from it. Bill, I want to thank you for the presentation. Um, 
I, I have, have gone through a lot of trainings as well, and this lines right up to uh, where my feelings are and where I think our community needs to, to move and to start at an individual level, to start with ourselves is so important and to ask those personal questions. And, um, and that has to happen first before you know, we move to that next phase. And, um, and that's my grandson in the background, if you can hear him. <laughs> um, I've been reading How to Be an Anti-Racist, uh, and I put that book in front of, of this book, so I, I haven't read this book yet. Uh, however, I've been um, uh, enlightened in, in many ways, too, and challenged. And I believe you're, you're right. We need, to, um, we need to understand where we're at first. And I like how um, you address, you know, we might be all the way over to the action step for, say, African-American, but we might start at the very beginning again for LGBTQ and, and that's okay. And just educating ourselves and, and us coming forth uh, where we're at too and, and just um, being aware and putting the work in to educate ourselves so that uh, when, when we're talking about uh, curriculum or we're talking about uh, educators or students that it is at our forefront, you know, um, what story they're coming with. Our, our, um, our vision, since I've been on the board, even before our new vision, uh, has always been about all kids. And, you know, what, how can we educate all kids and support all kids? And um, I think we need to, you know, continuously remind ourselves and, and remind our community that, you know, we have to always, um, we need to keep that mindset. Thank you for that, Pam. Anybody else have any more comments or feedback for Phil? Anybody feeling fired up and want to take on the challenge? I'm there. Oh, I'm there. I, um, yeah. I feel like I'm learning all the time. It's a good place to be. I think we said, even in our proclamation, I think that was one of the things that we changed when we were together last month and, and edited that proclamation together was that we would be lifelong learners. That was one of my favorite additions. And um, that I think the continuum that you just showed us, Phil, really gives us a great visual of what lifelong learning can look like in DEI. Um, I would also add, and I think you mentioned this in a couple of specific places, um, but a thread throughout is that so much of that happens in the context of relationship and community. And so that's with our school community in our classrooms as colleagues. Um, so I think that's a great place for us to start. Okay. Listen, hey, Amy, We're going to dig I, in. Yeah. Amy, um, I just want to check if Mary wanted to say something. I saw she unmuted herself. Come on, Mary. I, I was just going to say I didn't start with that book. I started with the White Fragility book. And um, I know mm -hmm. in, in reading mm -hmm. that, I, I'm reevaluating myself in, in terms of just having conversation and things that you might say that would be offensive that you didn't realize and um, just from being white. And um, so that, that's really hit home for me. And Phil, you did a great job. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, we have been doing white fragility and y'all know this, we've been doing white fragility with all of the building leaders this summer and the administrative staff, um, or at least the, our superintendent staff. And um, the feedback has been amazing. I think it really challenges you to kind of unlearn and relearn. And um, I think that would be a really interesting one for all of us to read. Well, that's been fruitful for you, Mary. 
I'm, I'm right there with you. Okay, I am going to um, get us started on what was actually our action item. I kind of hijacked it a little bit. If y'all remember last time we um, did some great work together around um, really thinking through our proclamation, our working definitions, and our um, vision statement. And one of the things that I asked y'all to do then was to be extra overt in your body language so that I could see, for instance, when Mary was about to share and I missed it entirely. So please keep yourself off mute if you are able to. Totally understand if you have a crying baby, although we do love babies in the background at all times. Um, so I encourage as much feedback and um, dialogue as you could, as we can get. It makes our work better together, and we've got a lot of, of actual hands-on work to do together tonight. So please engage, and um, again, this is pretty casual. So we're gonna we're gonna stop in the middle all the time, ask questions, um, dig in. So everybody, good. And I will I will change our grid so I can see y'all a little better. And I will make this a little larger. If I put it in presentation mode, I can't see all as well. But maybe I'll do it anyway. Okay, there we go. So y'all remember our vision, and I think I have it in here. I'm gonna go back to it just because it's important. So our district vision that we decided on um, and endorsed as a board was that we lead with respect, trust, and courage. We ensure an equitable, collaborative, and inclusive culture, and we enable all to achieve success. And so I'm reminding us of that just to say that's the bookends of what we're going to work on tonight. So Phil, Phil teed that up beautifully. We are going to be looking at how do we get that done? And when we when we originally um, began talking about the strategy that y'all endorsed back in May, what you saw was a real high level, um, and a couple of you may have, have seen some of those strategic action items, but you saw a really high level presentation about the goals and objectives around five different pillars, so governance, leadership, customers, um, our community, and our reputation. But there, there were lots of guts in that that we um, didn't have time to dig into, and it wasn't the right time or place to dig into, but now it is because we have decided that um, as a board, your leadership and your support of the work we're doing day to day is really important. And so we also decided that each subcommittee would own, and I'm making quotey fingers at you right now, each subcommittee would own some of the strategic um, action items that were the most relevant to that committee. We think we know where those belong, and we certainly want y'all to be engaged in the process of how those line up, but I want us to talk through those, partly because I want you to have a very clear understanding of the work that is to be done. Keeping in mind, this is our phase one strategy. This gets us rolling on some really important things. It's not the be all end all. But in our phase one strategy, we've got work to do and I want y'all to see what that is. But the second one is, I wanna make sure that this lines up with the subcommittees where it belongs because your expertise will be helpful, your support will be helpful, and that will give you um, that ultimate accountability across the district that we talked about for our next discussion on measurement. So, everybody good with where we are so far? And what I will commit to y'all is that these slides will go to you after this meeting so that we can further process the material and then we can make changes as needed. Um, I will also say that as, as we've been working through the strategic actions over the last several months since the May 18th board meeting, we've added a few things as we found gaps that need to be filled. Or frankly, as we've had some um, teachers and building administrators come up with some really great ideas of something that would move us forward, then we've added those 
So there are probably four or five new ones that have, have joined the list. That's a great thing because we want this to be evergreen so that we have addressed the gaps that we need to and that we have innovated where we need to. So that will continue. Okay, so starting with the administrative subcommittee, can somebody remind me who is currently sitting on that committee? I know it changes periodically. Go and John. I have, yeah, I have. Okay, so John and then who else is with, with John? Brad? Phil, Phil, John, and Brad are on the administrative and service. And I think it's, yeah, me and Brad. Okay, perfect. Okay, so for now at least. John and Brad Administrative Committee. And um, the way that I understand, so I would love to get clarification on this. The way that I understand the Administrative Committee is that this is a little bit of an umbrella committee. And this really addresses policy policy matters, overall district matters. Is that accurate? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we may have a few things that we want to put in a parking lot for later to determine where they belong, but, but this is a, a good place to start. Okay. So this is the overall administration of the district. So strategic action number one for us under administrative would be to create a DEI board committee and a standing item on the board agenda. I think what we chose to do with this one was to embed DEI in all of the subcommittees, which is the work we're doing right now, and that it would be a standing item on the board agenda. So if, if that's the case and that's where we're gonna leave this strategic action, I'm gonna call this one tabled for now. Does that feel good? That's fine. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's not, are, well, and that would fit are we going to table it or is it complete? I mean, tabling it suggests that we're going to come back and change something or take further action on creating a separate board committee. I thought the discussion earlier was this is so important that it needs to be in every committee. It needs to be a cornerstone of what all of our committees do. So uh, is the plan to revisit the structure at some point or are we done with this item? Because we've made the decision on where it belongs in our governance as a board. I understood it as what you just described, John, where we were making it part of the standing committees that we already have because it, it does touch every aspect of our, our district. Yeah. Or if it doesn't, we want it to. And so yeah. it needs sure. to be part of everything. Yeah. Okay. Then do you, would y'all agree then that this one should be completed? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a big nod for Mary. Yes. Sure. Great. Check and check. Um, assigning strategic actions to relevant board committees is what we're doing now. So that will be complete. Um, create an integrated actionable vision statement to replace the existing district and DEI vision statements. We have done that. And y'all have endorsed it. So we are three for three. Great work. <laughs> Perform a prioritized evaluation of policies focusing on equity. I gotta be able to see this equity and inclusion, benchmarked against state best practices. And um, my recommendation was that we focus first on the student experience. So any policies that affect that, that might be discipline, that might be grading, et cetera, um, HR and curriculum. So this is policy evaluation. Um, does it feel like that fits under administrative? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Great. Anything that we want to adjust on this or feel good about where, where that recommendation sits to start there? No, it Amy, seems like it aligns. Amy, do we need to use the word state? Can we just say benchmark against best practices? Do we need- We can. 
just focus or limit ourselves to state? Nope, I think that's a great call. So we can change that. Perfect. Okay, next would be provide DEI training to the board in line with the district office offering. So my recommendation there would be that the workshops we're doing now are not that training, this is work. Um, the DEI training for you might be something that is in line with what administration or building leaders or staff are experiencing and that we have an opportunity for you to take part in that. So that is that action item. So it wouldn't and include my like a training at a MASB conference or a conference like that. You're saying that specifically training within the schools um, and it might be a board member joining a building's training or an or our administrative training. Is that what you're saying? I think that is um, work that, that we would accomplish with Mike to decide what that would look like and or in the subcommittee. But I could envision that happening a couple of different ways. And Mike, please chime in if I am getting out of my lane. But um, I could envision what you just described, Pam, as board members participating in certain trainings. I could imagine that it might look like a specific training for the board itself, and that could be public just like we're doing now. Um, what I would like to see is that y'all get to experience some of the inclusive leadership training that we've been doing across this, the district, and that you at least have your eyes on the um, inclusion skill sets we'll talk about in just a minute, the DEI skill sets training that we will have for both our um, families, our students, and our staff. So this just says provide. It does not say that you must all complete all of that, but that there are opportunities for it. And and why is this under here. why is this under the administrative uh, heading? Do you see this falling in that committee and not in others? Is or will there be rough? replication? Um, I think the reason I included it here was because it was applicable to the board. The other trainings exist in other spots, so under curriculum mostly or under HR or leadership mm -hmm. training, but this one was specifically for the board, but I'm open. So it's not, it's not specifically for the committee, the administrative committee, we're talking about the whole board. Yeah, it's for the administrative right. committee to determine oh. what are the opportunities and so right. and how to administer. Correct. Right. Y'all feel good about that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. And would love to get your input on what y'all would like to see. So we will have professional development opportunities throughout the year. Some of those will be some pretty incredible speakers, et cetera. So if you would like to suggest or um, give me recommendations on what as a board y'all would like to experience, I'd love to hear it. For our next administrative <laughs> services committee meeting, would it be possible to find out what those opportunities, are? What, what the administrative team and building leadership teams are doing so that we can fan that out to the board from our committee and identify what options are available sure. for participation. That'd be helpful. Yes, we can do that. Okay. Next is developing our comprehensive hate speech guidelines and practices and connect, connect those to existing policy. We already have a policy on the book that makes sense to um, continue to link our hate speech guidelines and practices to. And I believe that because it needs to link to policy fits under administrative. We did some of this already. Are you saying that that's just a start? Yes. Yeah. 
And Mike, is Troon working on helping us with that, with revising some policies in that respect? So I we had asked them to, to do that. Yeah. So I always uh, caution everyone on the generic use of policy versus district hand, a student handbook, employee handbook. And so what we've done at this point with Truant's assistance is made some changes to the student uh, handbook. Um, we can look at employee's handbook as well. <clears throat> and then our policy generally comes right now from policy service called NEOLA, although, John, you and I have had some discussions about Truant uh, since they represent us. But their policies aren't quite there yet. I, we'll continue to watch that as we go. So um, I think there is some some language in policy, board policy, that can be looked at, but so much of it's dictated to you by um, legislative guidelines and language, and it's kind of high-level policy is, and then specific carry-out is the guidelines or handbooks in the district. So should we um, add, instead of just ending with policy there, add student handbooks and employee handbooks? Would that sit under guidelines and practices? Yeah, because they are guidelines and practices. Like Mike said, the policy is really over overarching and um, where mm -hmm. the student handbooks and the employee handbooks are more detailed on the day-to-day. -day. So if we're, if we're developing the comprehensive hate speech guidelines and practices, do we need to specify then handbooks as well? Or does that fit under guidelines? I don't think you duplicate sure it the right. Yeah, I don't think you duplicate. I think what makes sense to put in the policy, we put we put in the policy, but then there might be some details that it really doesn't make sense to put into the policy, but it would be nice to have right. in the handbook to be very clear in, in what we're looking for. Agree. Okay. I think our, our next one is to realign with the ESA on that partnership. So that is, is truly just to evaluate our partnership as it stands and ways that we can work more effectively together. So that is under administrative because it is um, at the leadership level, probably superintendent to ESA director. Y'all have any thoughts? Mike, do you have thoughts on where that might sit? Well, I was hoping you, when you spoke ESA, you were, you were speaking the um, idea that our entire county, um, which kind of is at the ESA level, uh, work together on this and build that partnership as we go forward. But certainly our ESA, we can reach to them um, and begin to see where they are. And I know they've been following us and watching what we've been doing so far. And so mm -hmm. um, yeah, we can certainly reach out to uh, John Searles and their board and see where they are at with that process or maybe we just do it at our whole county meeting um, with the other local school districts as well that'd be interesting um, i have done a little bit of work with a focus group already in the district with um, some administrative help some teacher help and um, esa help to map out some opportunities for us where we might be able to, I think, streamline our processes. And so scoping that out to a higher level at the county might be really interesting. Well, I think that works best. I mean, even though the ESA houses the vast majority of their programs in Midland Public, they do have um, Longview and they do have um, a few other uh, buildings where they host programs that are countywide programs and even in our even their programs in our buildings have countywide students in them and so sometimes we gobble that up and I think we need to include the other locals in this sure. language perfect I, I think that gets back to so we I'll just make a quick connection for us that occurs to me so we've been talking about the uh, I get the question regularly about focusing on um, racist and anti-racist um, change right now. And this is one where it, it becomes clear to us that the DEI work that we're doing is still across all dimensions of diversity. If we think about the work that we do with ESA, that is 
um, important to all of our students in specific ways. And so um, one of the requests that we had from ARM was to lead our, our um, colleagues across the county in this space and, and help them work with us. And so this is yet another way. Well, it may look a little bit different, but it is accomplishing the same goal. It helps us have a more inclusive culture, a more equitable culture. Um, and that gets into the next one, which is to build opportunities for collaboration and partnership. So that's not just ESA, but that may mean statewide. We've talked already at our last meeting about opportunities to collaborate with other ISDs or districts for training, for professional development, for um, recruiting, so all kinds of things, but to intentionally build those. To me, that's that an administrative, does that sit well for you? Yeah, I think one of the things that I'm cognizant of is, you know, we can, we can build the best relationships <clears throat> possible with other educational partners, but I think it's imperative to bring the community along and where we can reach out and develop more relationships with our community members. I think we're going to have more lasting success. Um, not that the educational institutions aren't important. I think it's just that our community mm -hmm. itself, of the community of Midland is just as important in that journey. Yeah, that's a great point. We'll see some of that reflected in our, our next couple of groups as well. So this is what I had under administrative as a body of work. What I'm hearing y'all say is all of this seems to fit. And so this would be the kind of material that you would you would be governing, that you would be measuring, and that we would be accountable to do under the administrative committee. I have a couple of action items that I noted. I'm gonna make a couple of changes to verbiage that y'all suggested. We are gonna look at um, maybe scoping out to the county for ESA. And then, John, I'm gonna provide y'all with the opportunities um, for training that the board can engage in that, that are already on the book. Okay, trucking through. Curriculum, so we've got a lot here, but a lot of these are, are pretty familiar to y'all. So who's on curriculum currently? I am. I am. We have Lynn, Mary, and Pam Hello. Singer on that. Oh, the all-stars. <laughs> so on curriculum team, um, evaluating our audit options, we've talked quite a bit about that, and that work is, is ongoing. Integrating equity and inclusion into a number of processes. So one of those that's a heavy hitter this next couple of years will be continuous improvement because the continuous improvement process is the perfect vehicle for equitable and inclusive change within our buildings. So it gives us the whole mechanism, the whole framework to accomplish change equitably and inclusively. So that, that one for me is an easy fit. These are as well, develop, develop guiding principles to evaluate new materials and books, and then a prioritized audit process for our existing materials. Another integration would be equity and inclusion within the multi-tiered systems of support. So that framework is, is coming in to integrate with social emotional learning, to integrate with DEI, another really important place where we need to embed institutionalized equity and inclusion because it is throughout that entire system. Assessing our professional learning communities, so how those align to DEI and how we can integrate DEI into those communities and then creating an infrastructure at the building level and integrating that one in, that into those learning communities. 
So this is really the, at the highest level for the building, making sure that there are the systems and support so that each building can do the DEI work um, that they that is part of their change process effectively. So I have all of that also under curriculum. Do you feel like that is an appropriate spot for it? Yes. Okay. Felt like learning um, fit best here. So any feedback on, on all of that? That is big, big work. It is big, big work. So I guess I'm sitting here wondering, you know, um, what, what this looks like and the amount of uh, investment and time that it's going to take and, um, and just trying to level set in my mind on um, processing, you know, okay, what, what makes sense and how do, you, do we keep moving down this road without completely overwhelming the system? So that's, I'm trying to think about yes. sustainability. How can we keep this sustainable mm -hmm. and not just go and overwhelm the system and then lose hope? I guess I, I would be looking towards uh, Penny to uh, lead us on this task and kind of prioritize uh, those things. What do you think, Penny? I'm ready. There is important work to be done here. And uh, Amy and I have been talking about uh, how to prioritize this. Much of this is really interconnected. And that's the tricky part that we're trying to figure out right now. But yes, Mary, we're ready. Excellent. Cool. Anybody else? So one thing to note here, okay, great. So this is gonna be true for all of our strategic actions or most of our strategic actions where there are a few that really are behind the scenes, um, go do's for, for Mike and, and administration. But where there is opportunity, there are project teams being put in place and starting in September that will have a community liaison and a teacher liaison with each project team. So that we have many, so that we have many hands make light work for some of this. We also then ensure that we are inclusively pulling in the expertise that we have across the district. Our our teachers, our building leaders, our staff, and that we are also um, engaging folks who really want to be part of the work. So the project teams are gonna be an important next step for some of these. If we think about a big task like assessing professional learning community concepts, we have a number of folks across the district who are already experts in PLCs. And so you pull them in and connect them with Penny's team and you have a, a pretty robust group who can get this work done. So I'm excited about the ability to use our resources really wisely because to your point, Pam, it's big work and we do want it to be sustainable change. I got to let everybody get through starting school first <laughs> before we do any of that. Amen. A couple of fun things, right? A couple of fun things coming up. The human library storytelling concept is something that our high schoolers asked to do last year and we may or may not get to do this year based on just how things shake out, but that's one that we hope to integrate um, under curriculum. It is a really powerful experience. And Pam is Pam has already been part of that before and, and can vouch for that. So we would love to adapt it for the high school level. Oh, that would be very exciting. Um, yeah, our principals are, are super on board with it. We just, we just need the world to calm down so we can do some of those right. things. We do have a visibility project right now that's podcast based. So in this time when we can't um, make an in-person mm -hmm. event happen, uh, we're trying to create as many virtual events as we can. That's coming up soon, isn't it, Pam? Uh, yeah, we are uh, publishing tomorrow uh, our intro and publishing okay. our first story with Kevin Kendrick and uh, Kimberly Houston Wednesday. Excellent. I'll send out a uh, yep. link to everybody when it's published. Great. 
Cool. Terrific. And that's a collaborative effort among a number of different organizations, right? Just like you and Aubrey. It is. Northwood University, um, Midland Kids First, uh, the Legacy Center. A um, uh, whole bunch. Whole I know, bunch. CAC, Inclusion Council. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then we get down to some more of the learning that we talked about a minute ago. So this is our DI skill sets learning for students. And then a companion segment for parents, guardians, families and then companion series for our community, nonprofits and businesses in particular. So we have an opportunity to uh, replicate the learning across the different stakeholder groups so that everyone gets to experience the same information, learn the same language, have some of the same conversations and experiences around that. I'm really excited about how that may look this, this will be another one that may look different in year two if we've got people in the building, but, for, but that doesn't stop us from putting this together. And even if we roll it out virtually, it will still be powerful. Um, and then another DEI learning opportunity for parents, guardians, and families specifically. So um, that may look like a um, DEI 101 for families that is, is really targeted at our parents. Activating our PTO. This is one that I wasn't really sure where it belongs, so I would love to get your input on this. Our PTO is a really interesting group that has an important sphere of influence for DEI, and so want to give them some specific learning. Where do y'all think that might need to go? I think it makes the most sense in, in curriculum instruction and assessment. Okay, great. Yeah. And then last is our community conversation series. This is something that our advisory group has been working on scoping out for us. So I think that fits well under curriculum. That's another one that may table until next year, but still working through it. Okay, so that's curriculum. We, we good here? Yeah. Any other really concerns, thoughts? Great. Lots of uh, stuff. Lynn, <laughs> or Lynn. Um, I, I, I'm reading all of this and just thinking about it. It gives me a little bit of heartburn, just wondering, you know, um, uh, how, how we're going to, to pull all of these things off. I mean, these all sound wonderful and they're all very important um, steps that need to happen. Um, but in the, in the current um, atmosphere, it, it does give me a little uneasiness and understanding kind of how we're going to move this forward and I would rely a lot on on Penny and and um, Mike to uh, help kind of frame what this looks like in in real life but and we may not even know right uh, establishing community conversations will be wonderful what a great event but um, it you know we're spending so much of our time educating students and we know it's imperative that our community comes along too, but then to own that is, um, boy, I wish, uh, you know, I hope that uh, we can have some strong community collaborators in there to um, help take that on as well. Agree, and, you know, keep in mind for me, this strategy is far reaching, so we are, this is not a one year, this is not a 12 month strategy. So some of these strategic actions will take quite a bit of time to accomplish. Some of and, them will even have phases as we go. So does and I that help a little bit? It, it's important to put those that into perspective because what I don't want mm -hmm. to happen is at the end of the year to come, you know, or quarterly to look back at these and say, wow, we got to do this, we got to do that. We got to think we have to do everything all at once and have it overwhelm the system and feel like we can't get it done. And I, I want to set us up for success so that we can uh, make these important steps and we have a plan on how we're going to get there and our community can, we can share information, we can share the strategy and, and the goals and, and how we're going to do that, but I don't want to put 
all these expectations out, like we're doing this tomorrow, and then feel like we're failing our communities without, you know, I just want to be very transparent to our communities, transparent ourselves to understand kind of the step-by-step -step process. Let's take it step-by-step, -step. let's do it right, and, and um, let's have something that can sustain over time. Thank you. Spot on, Pam. It's it's very important that we don't just develop a list and then check the list off. Um, where that may be beneficial to getting tasks done around uh, around the house, it's extremely important that we're thoughtful and and in how we do this so that it is sustainable change. And I think you're exactly right that we have to figure out what we can accomplish be reason you know be responsible as board members to not overload um our administrators and our administrative staff with with yes. with these things such that they lose sight of what else is also important but you know i think there's a lot of give and take there where maybe it's the next step with each of these <clears throat> subcommittees is to really just work with Mike and his staff on what is a, a, a reasonable multi-generational plan going forward with the knowledge that that plan is probably going to change and it, it can flex and we can adapt that plan one year from now, two years from now, three years from now, and, and I'm sure we'll add to it and take stuff off and, and change based on how implementation of the, some of these things did or did not go successful. Right. I think when I look at, at some of what we're doing with DEI, I think about um, PYP in the elementary schools, and I think about what Dirk did over there at Northeast. I'm trying to remember the name mm -hmm. of, of that. but um, High reliability how, schools. What was it, Mike? High reliability schools. Yeah, high reliability schools and how, you know, looking at a lot of these plans, it reminds me of, of those plans and I know how much these schools have invested in time and energy in order to meet all of these uh, requirements, you know, to get certified in. And it is quite a, a great accomplishment when you reach those, uh, but it is a lot of work. And I'm, I'm, I think our, our district is is all in but I, I really want to do the due diligence and set us up for success Still, I like what you said about making sure that this is not a list of tasks like you would have at home this is is certainly much richer broader deeper than that and must be thoughtful. I think the way I've approached my job this year has been to set you up for a multi-stage plan that would be evergreen, that can flex, that gives you a comprehensive look at what needs to be done and trust that the district leadership is going to prioritize and plan according to capacity, according to internal priorities according to expertise. So my job is to give you the whole scope of what needs to help create systemic change and help prioritize that. But certainly this is multiple phases of work. Right. So I, there should be some, some room to address all that. Okay, looking at human resources. Who's human resources currently? It's John Lauterbach, um, Lynn Baker, Pam Singer. Right. Wow, Mike is just rattling that off. Well, I have a very nice handy sheet in front of me. And so I was trying to keep them all from being put on oh, the spot. Oh, you got a cheat sheet. Yes. <laughs> that makes me feel much better. Yep. Okay. Um, we are fortunate to have Kyle Kowalski to help in, and uh, – lend his expertise to some of this work as well. So that is very helpful. Um, so in HR, one of the first things we have started working on already is embedding 
equity and inclusion in our recruiting processes into onboarding. So some of this work is already occurring now. Assessing pay equity, integrating equity and inclusion into the 5D evaluation rubric. So this is one that some of our administrators were excited about exploring. So they have a project team that will be looking at this in future. Creating and providing mandatory and optional DEI learning for our instructors, principals, and other staff. So that is nearly complete. Um, the creation of it is nearly complete. The provision of it will happen throughout the year. Um, we also have some, some neat opportunities to partner with some optional DEI learning in the spring. And again, John, I will get you those opportunities for that committee. Design and launch inclusive leadership development. That is already in place, designed and launched, and we are working through the final two cohorts of inclusive leadership with our building administrators. And then that will have been our, our whole building leadership staff. The other cool opportunity is that um, through some in-kind help from Dow, we are working on inclusive leadership as a companion to that, that will be uh, modules that are building leaders can do in the spring and then looking at maybe pulling in some LinkedIn learning licenses. So there will be many opportunities for learning for those who want to opt in to that. Leadership development is a, a space that all of our leaders have said they want more of. I so wonder that's if, something that we can provide. I wonder if this uh, leadership development, these extra classes uh, can also give their, um, their credits toward continuous education that they, that our educators need, you know, on a, on a consistent basis. There's a three letter acronym. I can't remember what the four. three letter acronym is, but. Pam, I'll take that one. That's a great idea. The sketch process that the state requires us to use. Uh, we can certainly consider that for any of these learning experiences and align with those timelines. So I'll mm -hmm. take that action item to work with Amy and make sure that we're doing that where possible. Perfect. So inclusive leadership book study with administrators. We are all currently working through White Fragility now. We've had a number of administrators who have said, we've learned a ton from this already, what's next? So we will follow that up with those who wish to opt in and then certainly our teachers are going to, I think we have about 200 teachers signed up to do their own building level book studies of white fragility in the fall. Which really? Is exciting. That is very exciting. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. So they, they will now have, because all of our admin leadership has, has done this together in small groups, they are all having time to process and will be able to help their buildings lead those in the fall. But um, those peer groups are pretty, pretty impressive. One that has come up for us uh, recently has been to develop project management processes and skill building. So as we roll out these project teams, we are, we are recognizing that there's not a consistent process for managing a project across the district. And in order for us to work effectively together on these project teams, we've got to um, engage some new skills there and some new processes there. So I have some things that are under review right now, just literal tools to help us effectively manage our work and um, excited about the skills that that will, will help us bring. Uh, next that, one is, is that educationally to, based or is that uh, from the business world or what, what are your thoughts around that project management process? Um, it is from the project management, from the business side. Right. And it's very uh, tried and true, I would say. Not fancy or pretty, but it gets it done. We do have some things on the education side, but those tend to be more theoretical, um, more about managing concept, less about, about tangibly measuring cha or managing change and running through a project. So it's to fill that gap. Um, the next three are about our resource groups, and this one I wanted to check with y'all. 
So our resource groups are um, affinity groups, community groups that are existing currently in our schools. We have several that would, I think, qualify as a resource group. So it's meant to provide a space for affinity, community, for leadership development for students. Um, it is student-led, just like our clubs. They come together and um, build community together. We, we have seen in the data that employees who are vested in resource groups are more engaged in their job and who they experience more job satisfaction and they experience more inclusive culture and are therefore activators of inclusive culture. So it's a great mechanism for culture change in any context. It's, if we are thinking strategically, go ahead. Do we already have that? I thought we already had that at Dow High. Uh, we have a couple of things that would kind of qualify as one of those. So the okay. Equality Club is one that could be that. Um, we have a GSA at Midland High that could be that. They've worked with some folks um, in the past at Dow to establish that. So I think we can build on that concept and refine it and then extend that to our employees too. So the yeah, place I, that, that we might start question. with that is around... Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Amy. No, go ahead. Um, I, I wasn't clear on whether we're talking about opportunities for our employees to provide leadership in affinity groups and resource groups, or if we're talking about providing our employees with opportunities to themselves participate in affinity groups and to provide support for them. Are we talking about students needing that support with our team as leaders, or are we talking about providing support for our team members who in their workplace need that, or both? Both, so students, okay. so supporting okay. the students to build their own with some, with some leadership help to, to do that well, and then, uh, but again, student-led, and then for our employees. Okay, but for our employees, we're not talking about something student led. We're talking about right led by other employees or outside yes. resources that we may, may we may need to pull in to be an inclusive workplace. Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah, I think that's a huge opportunity for us, and particularly going into this season of. Um, heightened stress that we've come out of and now are going back into in a different way. These are going to be more important now than ever. And so we have an opportunity to support our employees in this way. And then if you notice this last one is just to develop a plan to expand those for the high school and middle school, but that is, that needs to be done over time. So that is not a right now. We, we need to do some establishment and then build on that. So does all of this feel like it fits well under HR for y'all or do the resource groups need to go somewhere else? What are your thoughts? No, I think it, it makes sense here. I can't think of a better placement in the four groups. Okay. Okay, last one. So this is FFO, and um, for me, FFO made sense since its operation to pull in things like our data, our communication, um, a supplier partnership. So these will all be kind of in um, buckets of work. So we've got a bunch of work around data, so how we collect it, how we ethically report it, developing a survey for perception data. That is something we will do this year. Um, and then evaluate it to see where our opportunities lie and create a dashboard to use that for reporting transparently and publicly. So some of that is all underway already. So my question is, um, 
in the cur curriculum instruction and assessment, there's an assessment piece where you're looking at assessing data, right? Uh, does this piece mm -hmm. fall better under curriculum? I think my my recommendation was to pull it here only because it is beyond traditional assessment data that would fall under curriculum. So some of that will be HR data, some of that will be strictly demographic data, but I'm open. I personally I think it falls better under curriculum. Okay. Does it help, help me us understand that better? Um, well, we're looking at uh, integrating D, D, diversity, equity, inclusion data from across the district. And when I'm in the curriculum instruction and assessment committee, I'm looking at um, curriculum supports for our students that um, and and assessments that come back across the districts in many different realms and uh, when I look at diversity equity and inclusion I feel like my mind is in that same <clears throat> space of looking you know across buildings at assessments and seeing you know how we're doing across all areas when I'm in the finance facilities and operations uh, committee. I'm looking at financially all the financial data. I'm looking at, uh, you know, making sure our budget is in in line and that uh, DEI is is supported financially. Uh, but as far as um, looking at results, I, I, I to clarify, that. Pam, you are talking about bullet point number one, correct? Yes. Yes. And. Um, Maybe we can make that work, Penny, way in here, but Illuminate DNA, the the expertise in that system is in our curriculum department. So okay. So the rest yeah. of the bullet points, I think, belong here for sure. But we probably could make this one work in okay. either case. Correct, Penny? Yeah, I, I think it can fit. But uh, when Amy and I spoke about the data set around DNI, it is, or DEI, it really is more than just student achievement data or attendance data. Um, we have not yet fully talked about what that data set will look like, but it's across our operation. And I think um, the initial thought was if FFO is finance facilities and operations, that it, it would be an opportunity to look at that from the larger overview. So uh, it, either and or both. And at some point, we're all going to look at all the data. So whatever works, I'm, I'm on board. <laughs> right. Right. The okay. expertise, Penny, is, is in Illuminate is going to come from your department, so I think we could live with Pam's idea there. So Illuminate will have um, part of the data, but we can, yeah, either way is fine for me as long as we just have alignment on where that will fit. So maybe we, we consider where that one goes. Is that what I hear you saying, Mike? Yeah, I, I'm, I think we can curriculum. make it work either way. Maybe there's some reporting in both committees as we go. We we can fetter that behind the scene with all of us for them. Perfect. Okay, same thing for communication plans. So that I could see that living in a couple of different places as well. So developing a communication plan that is across the district that also includes a rapid response, that really is about infrastructure and about developing tools um, around that plan. So um, bolstering what we already have and closing any gaps there. Communication is, is one of those places that I think every organization has work to do. So um, one of the outcomes of that is that we have the right infrastructure to then communicate out our goals, outcomes, and results um, in the, the appropriate ways. And then the same thing for um, communicating a business case for why DEI is important because our community needs to understand that both from um, the, the business case for the thriving of our community and um, that that is two different opportunities for us to do that. 
And then the last one is any ways that we can partner with our suppliers to advance DEI outcomes. So that's both us learning from them and them learning from us. And we can have, again, a leadership influence there with the work that we do with our suppliers. Any feedback here on things we need to change? Add edit? Are we good? So welcome to my brain. This, is, <laughs> this has been um, Penny and I, um, lots of conversation and planning around this. And I know that there are a number of folks who are really excited to get started on some of this work as soon as we get school launched. You know, uh, I guess I would and ask, certainly. I would add one thing is if, if we decide, if, if you decide with, um, with administration that, uh, that Illuminate DNA data system bullet point falls best under FFO. I'm, I am fine with that because I see the other bullet points kind of feed that. And then if you pull one, do you pull them all? So I'm okay either way. Okay. Sounds good. So just know that we've already, we have some strategic actions we've already completed that aren't reflected here. I, I want you to feel excited about the potential here versus overwhelmed. And I want you to also feel proud that there's quite a bit we've already accomplished and that this strategy is, is meant to help us launch into the next couple years of work really wisely. And um, having it embedded in each subcommittee will help all of us to be not only accountable, but um, able to be ambassadors for the work effectively. No, thanks for the work. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. We need to have a, a high level plan and um, this is definitely well thought out. Thank you. So I had it to be determined, but we don't need it because we have mapped everything out. And now, um, congratulations, you have just resolved one of our strategic actions. So we've got everything lined up where it needs to be. And one more done. Should so we create, us, should we we create, about create like a handshake or a dance or something when we mark something off the list? <laughs> I think Mary, Mary's got a, a circle clap for us already. And yes, <laughs> I've noticed that that is something that we, as a district, have been working with our leaders on this. Our, our building leaders are so focused and so um, driven right now in particular that nobody stops to celebrate because it is like, yes, we have got this. Let's move on to the next thing and keep trucking. And so, yes, we need to stop and celebrate more often. And so um, I appreciate the, the moment to do that. We should do it more. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> I, I love it. Give me a woo-hoo. Um, thinking about measurement. So this is something that I just want us to talk through as a group. This is not something we need to decide tonight, but I want to give you the right tools to start considering this because it will be something we want to um, continue to explore over the next couple of months. So measuring our success is important. If you remember when we, we looked at our high-level plan back in May, our, we, we had a slide that looked like this, and the last piece was achieve together. And what we said was our board and our superintendent ensure accountability to deliver meaningful and visible results. And so we didn't specify what those were but we want to think about what meaningful and visible results might look like because we don't want to do all of this work behind the scenes and have no one feel the difference. It's, it's like when I, um, when I moved into my house, and my house is, it was built in 65, and the lady who lived in it for decades um, didn't want to change anything after her husband died. So when I, when I walked in, um, there was jade green carpet. There was bright red carpet in the basement. I mean, nothing had been changed since the late 70s. And um, I, was, I was ready to make meaningful, visible change 
with a quickness to that carpet. What I was not excited about was spending money on the sprinkler system or the electrical system, things that I wasn't going to see or really immediately feel. And that, was, um, that wasn't fun money to spend. The carpet was way more satisfying. The trick is we've got to have some of both, right? We've got to have some things happening behind the scenes. So lots of what we just talked about is work that people will see and feel when it's done, but they won't know that it's happening in the background. So we want to be sure that we have results that both are meaningful to our system and that they are visible. People can see the results of those, those actions. So to that end, I gave us a couple of things to consider, and this is where I'd love to open it up for just a, a good discussion. Some things that I thought about when, when considering meaningful results and what that might look like. So for me, that's where the traditional student achievement measures might fit in. Because those are meaningful not only to us as a way to understand success, because we said in our vision statement, enable all students to succeed, right? Enable all to succeed, including employees. They're not only meaningful to us, but they're meaningful to all of the other entities around the country that, you know, colleges, to trade school, all kinds of things, parents. So those certainly are meaningful. Um, another one that I think is meaningful on a couple of levels is retaining our great employees and our students. So that's meaningful for us. And then a third that's meaningful because of the data, we know that, that uh, data supports this, that an increase in engagement in resource groups is a meaningful result because we know that that translates into employees and students who are more engaged, who are more invested, who are enjoying their experience. So those are some things that I thought about around meaningful results. And if we want to flip over to visible results, some things that may be a little more qualitative might be our perception data. What's the change in perception of the employee and student experience? What is increased engagement from parents, guardians, families? We may not be able to track that quantitatively as accurately as we would like. And I'm looking at Brian Brutin right now, my numbers guy. Um, who loves him some data. The, but we can feel the change. We can see a change in engagement. You know if you're starting to see parents turn up more often at open house, right? That's, that's a visible result. Another visible result might be an increase in reporting of incidents, which would be important for us so that we can address and resolve those. So can we talk just a little bit about what some meaningful and visible results might be that you'd be interested in seeing. And I'm opening this up to everyone, Penny, Penny Mike, Jeff, Brian, please weigh in. When I, when I think about data that I'd want to see, I, I think of outcomes and I, Think of it in three stages, initial, intermediate, and long-term. And um, long-term is like stati your status you've achieved. You know, um, the knowledge gained would be that initial, uh, that initial outcome. The first thing we need to see is people gain the skills. We, are, we gain the knowledge. And once we gain the skills and the knowledge, then we can take action. So we should see actionable things in, in that intermediate time frame. In the long-term time frame, I would expect to see uh, better, better um, student outcomes, better uh, achievement outcomes. Um, I would expect to see better retention of both educators and students. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would expect to see um, not increased incident reporting, I would expect to see less incidents. And, um, and the, that increased incident reporting make, makes me a little nervous because is it good or is it bad? I'm not sure. Um, right. So I guess I, I, 
I kind of see it in, in phases. I need to know phase one is hit before I can get to phase two. And I know need to know phase one and two are hit before I can get to that long-term outcome that I'm so wanting to see. But mm -hmm. I like, you know, I, student achievement is huge because if we can, if we can do this in, in a, a, a manner that is sustainable and we can show that student achievement actually increased after we invested in this, I mean, we'll talk everybody into doing it. I mean, that's our best outcome. If we can say, hey, we, you know, you've got to invest in, in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it's going to make your district, your community stronger, and here's the data, that's awesome. Yep. Oh. There are there are districts that have done it. We know it can be done. I want to make one comment on the incidents really quickly. So I, I think of this much in the same way that my employer looks at safety and behavioral safety, or if Brad, Brad, I'm sure does the exact same thing. Is if if you're trying to drive a culture of, of safety performance in a company that has high risk, you <clears throat> the only way to eliminate fatalities and, and serious injury is starting by reporting scrapes and nicks and cuts and bruises. And when you drive a culture that starts to report those things, it, it raises up the awareness that employees have to like why it's important to wear your work gloves all the time, because let's not look over the little things because if you have a behavior behavioral tendency to look over the little things, God knows what can happen when you, when you make a mistake that turns into something huge. And I think I, I say that because we should all be aware that when we drive a culture of reporting the, these instances of, of, abuse or microaggressions, what, whatever you want to contextualize them as, we will see an increase in reporting, but it's to drive change at those big major things that we don't want to see happen. Um, it, just as, as, as we do with safety performance. Right. Um, yep. And I, I, I guess the other thing I was thinking about too, Amy is, you know, We've, we've now gone from, we kind of divided and conquered into the four different subcommittees, but the four sub different subcommittees haven't had a chance to really put in, in the hard work to really evaluate, okay, what's been handed down to me. We've all agreed to this at a high level and now we've disseminated it down. Now it's probably important for each of the subcommittees to get to work on it. And, and I think Pam, <laughs> there you go. Um, Pam makes a really good point that we we probably don't know all the measures yet, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. We know some we know some things that we can put in place instantly, but some of these are going to be much longer term. And we, act, I mean, to Pam's point, she makes a really good point on student achievement. We may know what the long term measure looks like, but we don't necessarily know that intermediate step yet. Um, so I think right. some of this is going to have right. to come with time and work. Yes, I, I think y'all are both nailing it. The um, I'll, I'll go back to the, the point on the incident reporting, and I put it here purposely so we would have this conversation because um, there have been a lot of requests for incident reporting and that for that data to be public and um, a number of conversations around that. And so I want to be very clear that if we are driving that culture of, um, I, you know, Mike did an amazing call to action for us a few weeks ago and that went out to the whole district. That call to action should mean that we get more calls, emails, that we get more identification of inequities, identification of exclusive behavior, which is what we want. We want that awareness. And we should see more of those because we've created not only a safe environment for that to happen, but we've created an infrastructure to resolve it. So 
we should see an increase in the very short term. So to go back to your phases, Pam, in the short term, that intermediate step should be us resolving and taking action and continuing to iteratively learn from the incidents that are happening, both at the student and the staff level. And then the, the long-term results should be a big decrease in what needs to be reported because the behaviors are changing. So I, I just wanted all of us to have an opportunity to really talk through what that natural arc of development ought to look like in our change management if we are really creating a, that culture of safety, of psychological safety to do that, that incident reporting and resolution well. Um, and then, you know, those are just those are just things that I've thought about. There are many ways that we can choose to measure, but this this slide is is meant to help us just think through it. So this isn't even necessarily a recommendation. It's a it's a thought exercise for us, and partly why I'm I'm wanting to send slides to you so that you can have time to process this. If we're thinking about this strategy as, and we've we've talked about this several times kind of a multi-generational plan. Some of these strategic actions will take quite some time to achieve if we do them well. So think about the audit. Think about a thorough policy review. Those are going to take a minute. And so some of these, these measures of success, if we measured right away, um, may even appear to be stagnant or move backward. And that's part of the natural arc. So looking at a year one, we might think about just measuring, you know, how many project teams did we launch? How many projects did we actually get started off the list? Or how many strategic actions did we complete? So just to say we got a running start. We meant what we said. Um, we may want to <clears throat> measure success by establishing a baseline on a perception survey. We may want to get some new feedback on uh, peer feedback from our leaders about how each of them are performing. So some things that we can do that are much more about the now, establishing how we're doing right now. Um, year two, we may have a little more information. We may be able to pull in something a little bit more quantitative, a little more meaningful, a little more visible by that point you might be able to see some changes in engagement by the end of year two that are significant enough to measure. And then by year three or four or five, then you begin to see changes in, you know, the diversity of our representation of our staff across the district because we've changed our policies, practices, guidelines, and now we're beginning to see the fruit of that effort. Same thing for our retention of our employees and our students. We may begin to see that in year three. We may not see a huge difference in year one, or it may be because of some other factors. But we definitely want to think wisely about the ways, what is important to us to measure, the student achievement, but what else? And we want to think about um, at what stage do those measures make sense. So I think that's, that's where I was heading with the meaningful and visible piece. We want to really be wise about what we measure, when we're measuring it, and what does that tell us about the change in our district. Any thoughts there? Tell me more about the 360 feedback. 360 feedback is a little bit of a generic term, but this is something that represents feedback from your peers, your, your key stakeholders. So it gives you, a, it's meant to give you a 360 degree view of yourself and how you are, how you're doing at this point in time. So how would you see that so versus happen getting happening one way? What's the thought? Um, it might be interesting to do that both at the building leader level. So you could do that within a building or you could do that across that level. You could also do that um, in specific teams. So that might be a curriculum team or that might be our superintendent team. 
to give us a, a fuller view of our employee engagement. And is your thought in just specific to DEI or, or is it something more I, than I that? I think specific, specific to inclusive culture. Okay. So these are suggestions that, that we could consider, but there are many more. This is more about kind of setting the expectation of how this might work. So help me know how to interpret. Are y'all um, processing? Are you completely overwhelmed? Are you feeling good and happy? I'm kind of in the, you know, this is a lot of information and I'm excited about, uh, you know, the direction and everything that the thought that's been put together, I would like to get in our committees and discuss, you know, next time I'm in uh, curriculum instruction and assessment, next time I'm in HR or, or administrative committee, I would like to mm -hmm. talk about you know, all right, how is this going to look? Is, you know, what can we do? What is a stretch? You know, how can we set ourselves up for success? But for yeah. me to sit here and get all this information and be a part of the plan and just thinking on my own isn't enough to give me the confidence I, I need to really um, buy in completely to a, to a change because we as board members aren't the ones that do the work, right? So, so we want to make sure we are setting our administrators up, our educators up for success and giving them the supports they need to be successful. Um, so I need to sit and think about it and I need to be in my committees and talk about it. Phil is nodding to that. Yep. Very, I mean, obviously the work here is, is there's a ton of work done. It's all extremely important and valuable to us. And we're learning a lot and it's, we're, we're all drinking from the fire hose and I'm ready to yes. get to work. But I think the, I think the work has to be done in the committees with Mike and his mm -hmm. team, really giving them some deference on, on making sure they know how to allocate people's time appropriately and, and balance that with all the other priorities in the district. And, um, mm -hmm. But the, the simple way to say that is that I, I agree with Pam is, is that we, we need to get into the committees and do the real work. Yeah. And the difficulty for <laughs> y'all is that Mike and Penny and I have been having this, these discussions. So this has been more gradual for us. You're getting it all at once. But the intent is to really help to level set you so that when y'all do get into committees, you at least have the context to start having those conversations. So I hope from that perspective, it's helpful. Absolutely. Can I, I just want to make a comment too on housekeeping. Um, so it's about a quarter to seven and we've got another meeting in front of us and was wondering um, yep. if we could have five minutes to grab a bite and Take a bio break. That sounds good to me. I have one quick question though for, for Mike. Um, along with the resolution that we passed um, in our last meeting and the, it's the board charging the uh, administration and administrative team and the superintendent to do multiple items as well as these items that we're talking about in committee. And as Pam said, where the work really gets done is with your group. Are you looking at a full-time addition to your team to run this for years forward? Yeah, I think we are, Brad. We've had a discussion internally <clears throat> As Amy um, gets approaching to her deadline date, 
Um, if that was a consultant kind of thing or a full-time conclusion or a full-time person, and we've kind of come to that conclusion as well. So we will have to uh, make that commitment with you on that, even though we know um, COVID-19 um, enrollment and state budgets are going to be get pretty drastically cut. So we're going to have to sit down and figure that all out. In between that and um, some commitments on that equity audits, those are fairly expensive as well if you use an outside party. So I think we'll bring you something here soon. We're trying to fetter that behind the scenes. So good question. I guess the answer is yes, but um, what level and how we can all support it, I guess, is yet to be determined. And can you just refresh my memory when, when that baton is going to be packed along? I, want, I don't want to say Amy's leaving, just say when it's yeah. the baton. Yeah, I think her 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 loan to us is in to to January. Is it February first, Amy? I think December. Yeah, February December. December. Yeah, so first of the year. So yeah. very soon we'll be bringing you something. We we have talked internally amongst um, somewhere in between where we find time <laughs> with COVID nineteen and virtual learning and online learning, and we're a little bit overwhelmed, but we are. We'll bring that to you soon. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just offer real quickly as a follow-up, Brad, that what, what's in the resolution all fits with the strategic actions that are reflected here. So there's not, I, I think there's alignment there versus a duplication of work. Brad, along with that, we've, We're not been, adding. we've been trying to solicit um, where there may be some resources to assist us with that as well. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we went through all items 2.1 to 2.3. I do need to uh, open this up to any requests to address the boards regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. So is this a good space, Amy? Can I segue to that? This is great. Okay, is you there can. anyone? Yeah, Mike? No. Okay, is there anyone that has a request to address the board? No. Okay. We have no one. All right. We will move into adjournment. If I, I could get a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn the meeting. I support that. Moved by Phil. Support by Mary. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone.